This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Chirurgeon. One of the most ubiquitous skills across fantasy games, be they of the tabletop or video variety, one of the most ubiquitous skills in games is the skill of healing. Every gamer knows that healing is important. Indeed, you don't go anywhere without a healer. You just don't. It's a dangerous, violent world out there. And you'd better have someone to patch you up and get you back in the fight. Of course, when we think of healing, we don't think of a natural process by which our body repairs damage. Which is a shame, because that natural process is actually quite amazing. Consider what happens when you suffer a minor wound. For example, let's say an ogre swings a massive broad axe at you and you take the blow to your arm. Assuming the ogre rolls about 8 points of damage and you're at least 3rd level, instead of being killed outright, you've got yourself a pretty nasty little cut on your upper arm. Now, your body is protected by an amazingly complex system of organs and tissues known as the integumentary system. And that system is responsible for protecting your body from infection and damage, maintaining your temperature, excreting waste, preventing excess water loss, storing nutrients, providing information about the external world, and blocking dangerous radiation. It also keeps all of your internal organs from being external organs. That's because your integumentary system is your skin. Well, it's actually any animal, skin, hair, scales, fingernails, and hooves as well as all sorts of nerve receptors and fat tissue and sweat glands and all sorts of other good stuff. Your skin, your epidermis, handles all of that stuff above. But the most important roles it has is keeping what you need inside in and keeping bacteria and parasites and other pathogens out. And when that ogre gives you a little cut, your body has two immediate problems. First, there's a hole in your body out of which your blood can flow and you need that blood to live. Second, there's a hole in your body into which bacteria can stream. And if bacteria infect your body, they can cause some major havoc. And so, your body has a four-part response to damage like that. The first part is called hemostasis. That comes from the Greek and means stopping the blood. And that's exactly what happens. Your body needs to set up a roadblock to close off that hole that leads directly into and out of you. And to plug up the hole, three things happen simultaneously. First, a broken blood vessel reacts to the breakage by constricting. It tightens up to lessen the flow of blood through it. But it's the second and third things that are really amazing. See, your blood is actually made of several different components. And two of those components react very quickly with exposure to the outside. First, there's thrombin. When thrombin activates, it starts pulling little dissolved proteins out of your blood and stringing them together in long, stringy strands called fibrin. The fibrin strands form a mesh or net over the breakage. Second, there's these little cells called platelets. And when platelets get activated, They turn from these innocuous little flat disks into tough, spiky little balls. The platelets catch onto each other, onto the walls of the blood vessel, and onto the fibrin mesh. Thus, the wound quickly gets blocked off by a hardened lump of solidified components from your blood. What we call a clot. Now that the immediate risk of blood loss and pathogen entry is blocked, your body moves on to the next step of the so-called regenerative process. This step is called inflammation. Within a few hours of the blood stopping and an itchy, gross clot forming over your wound, you'll notice that the flesh around the wound starts to become red, swollen, and tender. That's because your body has now gone into damage control. Your body can't be sure that invaders didn't get through the wound before it got closed off, so your blood begins to fill up with macrophages. These cells, also called white blood cells, recognize invading pathogens and respond quite reasonably by eating them. Macrophage comes from the Greek and means eater of big things. Macrophages travel through your bloodstream, so to allow them to reach the site of your wound, your previously constricted blood vessels now dilate. 
they widen. The increased flow of blood is what causes the redness, swelling, and tenderness. In addition to devouring any invaders, the macrophages also secrete various chemicals around the site of the wound. These build up over the course of a couple of days and serve to signal the next stage of healing to occur. During the proliferative stage, blood cells known as fibroblasts respond to the chemical signals and cluster around the wound site. They begin producing long strings of protein called collagen. Now, collagen is an extremely important protein used throughout your body. It provides a structure or framework for your body tissues. Mixed with minerals such as calcium, collagen provides the framework for bones and teeth. Without minerals, the long strands of collagen provide the tough, stretchy scaffolding that holds together the cells in tendons, ligaments, cartilage, and skin. Collagen also provides the basis for one of the most delicious desserts ever. When collagen is dissolved in water, the result is a gelatinous substance called... called gelatin. And gelatin is what gives jello its woggly joggly gelatinousness. Incidentally, collagen can also form the base for various glues. To this day, animal hides and bones are still ground up for their collagen. And that's the origin of the idea of sending horses to the glue factory. We apologize if you never look at jello or glue the same way again. But we digress. The collagen strands pull the edges of the wound together and provide an anchor point for new skin cells as they are born from the existing cells around the wound. And within a few days, the scab falls off and reveals a pale patch of fresh skin. Good as new. But interestingly, the healing isn't over yet, even though it seems like it is. There's a fourth stage of regeneration called remodeling, and it can go on for up to a year after the wound seems to be healed and done with. During this stage, your body actually rearranges the collagen scaffolding, and the collagen itself is restructured into different types of proteins. Your body does this to strengthen the newly formed skin in the muscles, nerves, and blood vessels around it. Now, it is interesting to note that regenerated tissue, that is, a healed wound, is never quite as good as the original. For small wounds, assuming you are healthy and heal well, the newly repaired tissue can recover 80 to 90% of its original strength and functionality. But after a more severe wound, the healed tissue may be significantly less strong or functional. That's part of the reason why serious wounds can leave a scar. But even leaving aside the reconstructive period of healing that can take up to a year, natural healing is just a bit too long in your average video game or computer role-playing game. That ogre is coming back for another swing. And even if that one doesn't kill you, there's always another ogre. And so in the gaming milieu, we tend to think of healing as something that comes from an enchanted potion or a magical spell, or if we're in a modern or sci-fi setting, from an injection of some unknown substance or from eating a medical kit. But the point is, healing in games is usually instantaneous. Worse though, that instantaneous magical healing is usually so prolific among the heroes of the game that zero thought is given to who is providing for the medical needs of all of the quest givers and shopkeepers and random expositional slubs on the street that fill the rest of the world. For that matter, if you found yourself transported back to the Middle Ages and you broke a bone or had a fever, where would you go for help? Well, your first stop might just be a barber. Today, we think of a barber as a hairstylist, specifically a hairdresser who specializes in men's hair. And while to some extent barbers have always had something to do with hairdressing, barbers have also played a lot of other roles in society. For example, a few thousand years ago, during the late Stone Age and early Bronze Age, they had the important job of letting evil spirits out of you and tying good spirits into you. See, some ancient tribes believed that spirits, both good and evil, could enter a person's body through their hair. If a person had bad spirits inside of them, you could get rid of them by cutting their hair. Various tribes from this era developed specialized hairstyles meant to repel or attract the right kind of spirits. And some of the earliest razors in the archaeological world date from the Bronze Age 
and were used in elaborate rituals. First, the participants would dance wildly, flailing their hair around to unleash the evil spirits. Then their hair would be cut. Rituals would then be performed to attract good spirits, and once the good spirits were inside, the hair would be tied back tightly to keep them from escaping. Later on, the Egyptians were both superstitious and extremely fussy about their hair. From their writings and drawings, we know that shaving was a common practice, especially amongst the priests. The Macedonians of ancient Greece were also a bit fastidious about their facial hair. Greek freemen, especially soldiers, kept elaborate beards. At least, they did until 331 BCE. Supposedly. According to some stories, Alexander the Great ordered his soldiers to shave their beards after, during a decisive battle, the clean-shaven Persian soldiers started grabbing the Greek soldiers' beards in close combat. While some consider this story apocryphal, it is true that the beard went into a decline in Greece after that. But it didn't go into decline in Rome. In 296 BCE, a Sicilian by the name of Ticinius Mena brought the arts of facial shaving and hairstyling to the city of Rome. Mena and his students and imitators soon began offering barber services, which comes from the Latin word barba, meaning beard. Barber shops in ancient Rome became social centers. Well-to-do men would gather to trade gossip, engage in political and business deals, and relax while having their faces shaved and hair groomed by professionals. What does any of this have to do with medical treatment? Well, we have to move forward a few centuries at this point and discuss the idea of a tonsure. See, as we mentioned above, it was not unusual for hairstyles to have religious, spiritual, or social meanings. It became common practice for men and women entering monasteries or convents, that is, men and women who became monks and nuns, to shave some or all of their hair. No one is quite sure where or why this practice, called tonsure after the Latin word meaning to cut off, no one is sure why this practice started. Some have suggested it dates back to the ancient custom of keeping slaves clean-shaven to indicate their servitude, and monks considered themselves servants of Christ or God. Others have suggested that it harkens back to the Egyptian practice of keeping the top of one's head shaved bald to honor the sun god. Still others suggest that a shaved head with a crown of hair around the perimeter serves as a reminder of the crown of thorns that Jesus was forced to wear when he was crucified. Regardless, by about 1000 CE, it had become common for Christian monks to keep their heads tonsured. And by the way, the familiar Friar Tuck style of tonsure with the bald top and the ring of hair around the head, that was one of three main variations of the tonsure. It was known as St. Peter's tonsure, or the Roman tonsure. The St. Paul tonsure, or Eastern tonsure, involved shaving the entire head. And the St. John tonsure, or Celtic tonsure, involved shaving the front and top of the head from ear to ear, but leaving long hair in the back. Because of the need to maintain the monk's tonsures, monasteries started employing the full-time service of barbers. But over the years, barbers had picked up a number of other services, all of which were useful in the monastery. For example, barbers learned to dress wounds, pull infected or broken teeth, set broken bones, remove lice, lance and drain skin infections, and perform other acts of practical medicine. They also became skilled bloodletters. Sorry, yes, we are back to blood and some other unpleasant fluids. In our many discussions of alchemy, we've hearkened back to the ancient Greek idea that there are four qualities in the universe that can be broadly understood in terms of elements. Don't worry, we're not going through all of that again, but the theory of four elements fed into everything the ancient Greeks believed about everything, including about health and the human body. See, they noticed something interesting. If you leave a jar of blood just sitting out somewhere, apart from really upsetting the neighbors, you'll notice that the blood will separate itself into four different layers. Go ahead and try it yourself at home. Greeks concluded that there were four liquids in the body, and they eventually became known as the four humors. See, today we think the word humor refers to a happy sort of mood, but it used to refer to any sort of mood at all. However, it originally came from the same root as humidity. Humor means fluid, 
and specifically it means a bodily fluid. To this day, in medicine, doctors refer to the aqueous and vitreous humors that fill the eyeball. So the Greeks invented the medical theory of humorism. Basically everybody's body was made up of four liquids. The sanguine humor, blood, was red in color, hot and wet, and was associated with air. The phlegmatic humor, phlegm, was clear in color, cold and wet, and was associated with water. The choleric humor, yellow bile, was yellow in color, hot and dry, and associated with fire. And the melancholic humor, black bile, was black in color, cold and dry, and associated with earth. And each one of these humors influenced specific aspects of a person's health as well as their temperament. That's because the humors weren't just liquids. They were also thought to be vapors that could pervade the body and the mind. The practical upshot of this was that a patient in poor health or with an odd temperament was probably suffering an imbalance of humors. And they could be set right by bringing those humors back into balance. And since the blood contained all of the humors, but it contained blood most of all, someone who was suffering from minor ill health or odd temperaments could be easily treated simply by removing some excess blood. Incidentally, some ancient doctors like Hippocrates and Galen encouraged men to seek bloodletting specifically because men don't menstruate. They believed that women's menstruation kept their humors in balance. But we digress. Among their other skills, barbers learned bloodletting. By the 10th or 11th century CE, barbers had become a one-stop shop for practical medicine, and they became known as barber chirurgeons because they practiced as both barbers and chirurgeons, which was the Middle Ages word for someone who could provide practical medical care and from which we derive the modern word surgeon. In point of fact, the symbol of the barber pole derives directly from the joining of the practices of barbary and surgery. In London, it became common for barber chirurgeons to advertise their practices by leaving bloodletting bowls in their windows. But the bloodletting bowls were filled with, as you might expect, congealed blood. The blood attracted flies and exuded a horrible smell. Eventually, in London, the practice was outlawed and this left the barber chirurgeons without a simple way to advertise. So they replaced the bowl with a pole around which they would wrap blood-stained, but not bloody, bandages. Thus, if you saw a pole wrapped with red bandages, you knew there was a good place to get a shave, a haircut, and have some of your excess blood drained to cure your indigestion. And that's the origin of the barber pole. And that's what you would look for if you suddenly found yourself transported into a fantasy world, only to discover you were actually in 12th century Europe and that there were no healing potions to be had. What you probably wouldn't look for was a physician. See, today we think of physicians as doctors, but in the late Middle Ages, physicians were academics. They studied the body, they studied health and humors, and they might even examine wealthy patients and recommend particular treatments but they considered the practice of medicine, the actual conducting of medical procedures, to be beneath them. At that time, if you did manage to get a physician to examine you, they would send you to a chirurgeon for treatment. They certainly weren't going to get their hands full of sanguine humor and yellow bile. Between the years 1096 and 1745, barbers suffered from frequent professional identity crises thanks to guild and academic politics. It all started in 1096 CE in France when the Archbishop of Rouen prohibited the wearing of facial hair. At the time, barbers and chirurgeons were one and the same. Thanks to that decree, they became quite wealthy in France as their shaving services were in high demand. And that allowed the barber chirurgeons of France to form a guild. For the next century or so, barbers and chirurgeons were one profession. But in the urban centers, especially Paris and London, Medicine was becoming an increasingly well-defined academic field, and as more complex techniques developed in practical medicine, there appeared a new class of physicians. Practical physicians. So a way was needed to distinguish between common barber chirurgeons and academically educated chirurgeons. 
Thus, in Paris, barber surgeons became known as surgeons of the short rope because they wore aprons or tunics, and academic surgeons became known as surgeons of the long robe because of their long scholarly robes. Over the next few centuries, professional barber surgeon guilds would spring up across Europe. These include the world's oldest barber's guild, the Worshipful Company of Barbers, which still exists in England today. Tensions increased between the physicians and the barber surgeons. Attempts were made to separate the two practices by various rulers. Physicians attempted to bar barbers from entering universities, and guilds and organizations rose and fell. Then, in the mid to late 1500s, Amboise Poiré became the most famous surgeon in the world. He had started as a common barber surgeon, and then became a combat medic. While treating soldiers in Piedmont and France, he began making careful observations of the results of different types of medical treatments. And he began experimenting with both old and new medical techniques. His experiments led him to reject some of the common medical practices of the day, such as treating wounds with oils, in favor of ancient Roman practices, like treating wounds with albumen and turpentine. He also challenged the practice of cauterization, that is, burning wounds closed. Instead, he discovered that he could sew wounds closed, especially in arteries, with small pieces of thread called sutures. The process was called ligature. Paré became famous for his experimental methods and his willingness to challenge the common practices of the medical profession of his day. He wrote several books and served as the royal surgeon to both King Charles IX and King Henri III of France. And as a result of his fame as both an academic physician and a common barber surgeon, various laws were passed in Europe, merging the organizations of barbers and surgeons, particularly in England and France. And that merger would last until the mid-1700s, when the barbary and surgery were finally separated by law once and for all, and barbers were forbidden from practicing surgery. And so... While you might be toasting your victory in combat with a tankard of greater healing potion, spare just a moment to consider the fact that the person who's paying you for those ten werewolf pelts is probably sitting in a comfortable chair, enjoying a hot shave, a relaxing trim, and is having his blood drained into a bowl to perk up his mood under the careful ministrations of his friendly local barber chirurgeon. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.